Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another session of Gather to Grow here with Food from Zanzi on Twitter Spaces. My name is Dawn Numdu. I'm your host this evening, and tonight we're talking spring onions. My speakers are already here, and I'd like to welcome them and thank them for taking the time to be here and to share some of their knowledge and skills. Remember, every week we invite farmers from different backgrounds, you know, farming on different scales to talk about their farming production and just more about a specific crop. And we've covered so many topics, and tonight we're talking spring onions, like I mentioned. And without me babbling on for much longer, I'm going to ask my guests to tell us a little bit about themselves, you know, where they farm, where their farming journey started. I always love this part because I get to know more about my speakers and just meet so many amazing farmers. Andile Matukane is the founder of Farmer's Choice. Um, she's actually one of the first farmers that I met and that I really, you know, love what she does. So more about you, Andile, as we kick off tonight's session. Hi, Don. Hi, everyone. I'm Andile Matukane, the founder of Farmer's Choice, which we're currently doing rooftop farming in Pretoria Main Lane Shopping Centre. This is quite exciting to share more details of actually the journey and what we currently are producing. Thanks, Andile. I think when I first got to know you, you were known as the spinach queen. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> I also thought of that. I'm like, okay, probably then when we met, I was a spinach lady. I wonder what name would probably pop out now. Name tends to pop up eventually with whatsoever that you tend to do. People tend to describe you based on that. I think I still, uh, if I close my eyes, I can see you with that big, you know, <laughs> I don't know if it was spinach or cabbage in your head. The picture was a cabbage, but yeah. one crop which I was known best for, it was spinach. Yeah, I remember, I remember. So thank you so much for being here. It's really great to have you with us and to share more about the crop that you're currently producing, which is spring onion. So thanks so much. Devrol Lechodi, she's the founder of Devrol Herbs. Devrol. Tell me more about yourself, you know, where your journey started. I know a little bit about Antile, but maybe you can tell us about where agriculture bit you the first time. Well, hi to everyone. Hi, Dawn. Getting to the farming industry really stems from aquaculture, funny enough. So I took a trip to the anthropologist in Midrand, and I was so excited to see the whole aquaponics situation. So when I, once I got there... I saw that actually there's a whole rotation, all production from your fish to your herbs. And so when I found out that they were doing a lot of herbs in, in the whole aquaponics farm, it was really cool. And then I asked myself, what is this whole herbs and what is the situation going on? And so when I was told that actually the feces are fertilizer for the herbs, I was like, oh, okay, this is how it started. So the bite was from aquaponics. Once I got home, starting to utilize the land, funny enough, I started out with spring onion, but I was supposed to start with chives, but had an alternative to spring onion. And so when I started planting it out, I was like, ah, this is where I need to be. This is life. And I started out with spring onions, funny enough. From then on, I decided to call the company Devil Scenery Farm. I am an artistic farmer, to put it to say, hence the cinetic, because, you know, once you cultivate your produce, you know, the views are just beautiful to watch. And that's where it all started out. And so I generally just loved to be around the farm, part of the soil, understanding it. And I fell in love with it. And I think this is where it got me today. And when I met Andile, she was actually my mentor, from being mentor to friends and farming and, yeah. Basically, this is Devil Scenery Farm, Devil in the farming industry. Her love from aquaculture now went straight into herbs. So, yeah. Thank you so much. I think from both of you, I'm just getting so much love and just, you know, inspired again by the dynamic people in the sector and the dynamic women in the agricultural space. So, Devil, thanks so much for sharing a bit about your story and where it all started and just your passion for the industry. Now, as growers, what makes this crop so attractive to grow? Devrel, you say that's actually the first crop that you started growing. Why choose spring onions? And so maybe you can talk about some of the varieties most commonly, you know, grown in Mzanzi, just to kick off the conversation. Andile, can I start with you? 
Why spring onion? For me, I find it funny or interesting every time someone asks me about all the crops that I produce. Simple terms, I mean, the choices that a farmer makes. And in other ways, I get to decide on what to produce for you since you eat on a daily basis. But besides that, I mean, it's always interesting to just watch something grow from a seed up to where it gets to be called the spring onion, where it's no longer a seedling, but now it's an actual produce that one can sell. And there's a number of cultivars or varieties that people tend to love or people tend to sell or grow out here. For instance, on my side, I grow the Slender Star, but other people tend to prefer Velocity or Apache. Those are the mainly three that most people tend to grow. But in most cases, it happens to be Slender. I think it's the most commonly known by most people. And also for me, I'll say as a hydroponic farmer, I always say this with most of my employees to say when we're harvesting the spring onion, it takes me to a certain restaurant or it takes me to a certain place where I tend to imagine this plate. I tend to imagine some sort of food where spring onion is involved. It's the same as when you're growing herbs, when you tend to hear get to smell the smell of coriander, rocket, or parsley, it will certainly take you to certain places where you're like, I once had this pasta and it had parsley on it and it smelled this good. So it's the same as spring onion. Whenever I grow it, when it's time to harvest it, it just takes me to a certain place with the smell. But then besides that, I'll say we all eat different sorts of food whereby spring onion is one of the most veggie, which people tend to love. And also it's beautiful to have on a dish. Now, my mom always tells me don't romanticize farming, but you made it so, sound so romantic, Adile, just talking about, you know, how it smells when you harvesting. I love it. And many farmers have described it. And I mean, Devil just said the same thing. It's an art for her. When she walks in her field and she sees a crop, it feels like she's an artist. So definitely agree with you there. Devil, you happened to farm with spring onions first when you started in the industry. Why did you choose this crop and what are the varieties that you choose to grow? So it takes me back to the Inca colleges back in Midrand. I fell in love with the chives, especially the smell of the chives. And you know, when you go to the movies, you sprinkle some chives and butter. And I was like, what is this? And so when I decided to go to the field to start planting, I was supposed to start with chives. And so Plant Forum didn't have the chives. They only had spring onion. When I got my first 5,000 seedlings of spring onion, it was just so easy. But, you know, they don't really give you a manual on how to transplant it. You know, I took everything from the seedling trays, started dividing everything, singling it out on the drip irrigation, only to find out that, no, that's not how you do it. You're supposed to, as they give it to you at Plant Forum, you should transplant it the way it is. When it started growing, I could see the magic. I could say it was magical to see because I never thought that it would grow so quickly and become as big as it was within like two weeks because I was not waiting for it to be grown as much in two weeks. Because my soil is quite fertile, I then decided that, oh, okay, so I shouldn't make it too big because then it will become something else that is not a spring onion. And the varieties that are there, like Andile said, Slender Star, Apache, and Velocity. So I usually have the Slender Star and the Velocity. The Velocity, you don't quite usually get it as a seedling, but you actually buy it and stack iris in seedlings in a tin or in in eight kilogram kgs so once you start doing your own thing it it becomes a norm to the fact that okay now i'm supposed to be feeding somebody somewhere but they love the smell of a ceiling they use it for different things just like what andy said it's how a person grows it and how they see it and how they put it on a dish or how they cook it is really up to them my part is that once i grow it i mean spring onion velocity is very easy to maintain there's no fussing there's not much maintenance once it grows. And for me, that was, that was the start of farming because it was easier. It was not difficult. And so once I started out with spring onions, 
I was gone. And selling it, I thought maybe it's going to come as a produce that everybody eats. No, it's actually a niche market. Not so it's not everybody that eats it, especially, you know, in your African household. It's more of the restaurants that they use the spring onions. And some people just fantasize um, spring onions in their dish. And I'm like, as long as I do my part, you love it when I give it to you. I'm good as, as a producer. It sounds like as a first crop, you did well with it and you continued with it, which is really awesome. Now, let's talk about timelines. I think Devil touched on it a little bit now in terms of why it's attractive to her as a crop to grow. But what is your advice to new farmers thinking about growing it? As Devil also said, it is a niche crop. And Dile, what's your take? And also, maybe you can just briefly explain why you chose to grow hydroponically. Is it because where you're based at the moment? The reason why I chose to grow spring onion, one, it's because recently I'm into hydroponic and the system that I use is more for leafy greens rather than all the other sorts of crops. So then part of leafy greens that I have, I decided to try out spring onion because I've planted onions before and spring onions being the leafy greens, I thought, hmm, let me try out spring onion. But just before having to try out spring onion, and this is part of the advice that I'll give out to other people as well, is firstly, before you tend to plant, doesn't matter if it's spring onion or it's any other herb that you want to plant, do your market research. As Devil mentioned that not everybody buys spring onion. So if you tend to do your market research, that gives you your target clients or your customers to know that okay, it's fine, I'm going to plant spring onion. At the end of the day, funny enough, me being on the hydroponic side and devil being on an open field, it's two different things. I have it quicker than she can. So me having to do my market research before I tend to plant the spring onion gives me an advantage to say, the moment my spring onion is ready, I'm going to be able to take it out from my farm direct to my customers rather than having to sit back and telling people that I have spring onion, who wants spring onion? And that also tends to sort of give me that troubles in terms of pricing because now anyone can come and say, I can take all your spring onion, but only if you allow me to pay you a foreign. And if you haven't done your market research, then you mostly desperate for a market. You agree to that which certainly you'll be at a loss, whereby if you start with your market research, knowing that I'm going to sell my spring onion to Devil because already she has clients, she knows who's looking for spring onion, that gives you an advantage to say, Devil, I'm selling my spring onion at a 10 rand a bunch. And obviously, you know that Devil needs the spring onion, you'll be able to sell it out to Devil. It's much important for each and every farmer to do their market research based on the crop that they want to plant and know who they're going to sell it to. But for me, I did my market research and I knew exactly that, okay, fine, part of the leafy greens that I grow, I'm going to add spring onion on them. And I knew exactly where I was going to take my spring onion and where I'm currently taking my spring onion. because. Yesterday, I was busy harvesting spring onion. I'm sure I smelled like spring onion the whole day, which other people love the smell. And I sort of enjoy the smell as well because I ended up smelling like spring onion. So I could have sold myself as well as a spring onion. Very funny. <laughs> I love you guys. You kind of so much humor. I think you've listed a lot of the basics that farmers should know before planting this crop. And I think market research is one of those things that can never be underestimated. So thanks so much for just highlighting that. Devro, for someone that's planting in an open field, what should farmers know in terms of soil preparation? And I think maybe you can also just elaborate how that works for you hydroponically and delay. But Devro, over to you, just in terms of people who are now considering planting this crop, what should they be thinking about when they prepare the soil? The soil cultivation must be such that it does not pulverize the soil. So in other terms, it means that when you make your beddings or your ridges per se, it should be very soft and very moist before you do transplanting or direct planting. So it's very important also to 
know that when I speak of soil, the climate requirements as well, it's also part of the soil preparation as to where are you in your area of planting spring onion. So with onions, um, you know, have a relatively shallow root system with most of the feeding roots occurring in the top 200 millimeters of the soil. So the spring onion, very important to know that it's very sensitive to water logging. The shallow roots allow it to be grown successfully on most soils. So your soil analysis and your water analysis is very important, especially when you're planting on my kind of a soil, which is very fertile soil and very loamy, and it has a lot of retention on the water. But you do not want your soil to be waterlogged because it will obviously make the spring onion to be not quite happy with the soil as it is very waterlogged. And because they have very shallow roots, it will obviously make it impossible to grow its more expectations. So your soil preparation, it must be on point. It must be very fluffy. You should actually, when you walk on top of your soil or your ridges, you should actually be dipped in. Your foot must be in so that you know that, okay, then fine. Your spring onion will be easier to grow. So it's very important as well to know that the plants can tolerate much heat, you know, the climate. The plants can tolerate much heat during the later stages of development when higher temperatures are more favorable. So your higher temperatures daily averaging to 25 to 27 Celsius, they accelerate to a bulbing process and are preferred from the start of the bulbing onward. And so you don't want your bulbs to be very big and something that is no longer looking like a spring onion. Now it becomes something else. And so hence, when you are doing your soil preparation, your climate as well, wherever your area is, it shouldn't be a, an area where it's raining a lot because now it could affect a lot on your spring onions. And so with the open land and as well on the field, your heavy clay soils are less suitable to work and can cause serious problems at harvest from their physical state. Thanks, Devril, for that. I think it's very important. Also, I think one important aspect is soil testing. And I love what you said about it's a good example, putting your foot on the soil and then seeing that it's soft enough for your crop as well. Let's talk about planting from seeds or seedlings. I know often farmers said, you know, it's easy just to get seedlings, but what's your take? And then also, how long does it take to germinate if you're planting from seeds? And then maybe just around timelines, you guys said that it's a pretty fast crop, so it grows very easily or very fast. What should farmers be thinking about? Antilia, would you like to take this one? I'll say my part, and I think Devil will say her part as well with this one. But in most cases on my side, I'm on hydroponic, so I can't really grow from seed to seedling using my system. Rather, I buy seedlings and then grow it from there. But funny enough, I just tried out something whereby I buy my own seedling trays and also having to start my own seedling production. I think if you starting out saying you want to grow spring onion, rather you do your research, choose between the cultivars that you want to do. Is it velocity or is it slender? Be sure of which one you want to sell. And that is also goes back to your market research to say which one do people prefer because also somehow they tend to differ in colors so once you tend to do your research knowing very well which one you want to plant rather you buy seedlings reason why i'm saying rather you buy seedlings it's because if you buying them from someone that you trust in most cases i'm getting my seedlings from evergrow which is the people that I trust with the production of my seedlings. And you need to know how seedlings should be when you're buying them, as in when you're receiving your seedlings, the smell of the seedling, the color of the roots of your seedlings, the size of the seedling that you should get, and the edge of the seedling as well matters. That's when you're buying the seedlings. The other disadvantage with growing your own seedlings, especially if you're just starting out, it's that you might get a 20% germination. Reason being, you might have done something wrong along the way, unless you know how to grow seeds to seedlings. But if you don't, rather you buy seedlings, which are ready for you, and you make sure that all your seedlings are correct. They don't have funny smells. They don't have funny colors. The roots are white. They're not brown. They're not black. And then you know it's your responsibility. That's like your baby then from seedling up until the whole 
production process. But if you're going to start growing your own seedlings, you need to be prepared that you might have to do that 10 times before you get it right. And the reason why I'm saying you might have to do do it 10 times before you get it right, it's because it's a process and people need to understand that your seedlings need to be uniform whenever you're planting them out because... If you're getting a seedling which is way shorter than the other one, when you're harvesting, that means one of your crops or one of the plants, when, when it's time to harvest, it's going to be shorter than the other one. And when you get to the market, obviously, I'm going to ask, why is this one 9 rand and the other one it's 15 rand? Or why are they all priced the same? And you're only doing that because you planted them all at the same time. So if you're good with seedlings production, you can use your seeds from seed to seedling and then growing out. But if you're not good, rather you buy your seedlings from the people that you trust, from people who will tell you which cultivars they've used, how old the seedlings are. Thanks, Andile. Daryl, maybe just your take on the timelines as well. Maybe you can elaborate on that. And also what your experience was and maybe some tips for farmers and then we'll move on to transplanting from there. With direct seeding, per se, to say on when you're doing from seeds and not from seedlings. So the direct seedling, you're sowing in the field, produces an earlier marketable for up to, I think, six weeks sooner. And also it avoids the labor intensive practices of transplanting, just like Andy said that everything needs to be uniformed. So in order for everything to be uniformed on your side of the field, you also need to take initiative that once you be planting in a basic area, which is probably half a hectare. I would love to speak of a half a hectare mainly because I do a hectare every single time when I do plant. So my advice would be that you don't plant everything on one time. Most importantly, when you have to harvest, it becomes, like Andila said, it's not easy when you have to harvest on my side. It's very easy to harvest it out, but to actually prepare it to the market, that's where the difficult parts come in. And so going back to the seeds, when you're planting it out, it is important that you know that the seed is generally sown in rows about 150 to 200 millimeters apart and to a depth of 10 to 15 millimeters in very well-prepared and well-fertilized soil. So your kilograms for a hectare would be 6 to 8 kilograms of seed that you can get in slender star or velocity at stuck areas when you want to plant it in seeds. But you don't take all the seeds for a hectare or up to 8 kilograms and you're doing a whole hectare. It is not the best advice I can give you. I know that much because I've done it before. And it caused a lot of chaos on the farm because it was no longer a spring onion. It looked more like an onion rather and not a spring onion. You know, the size of how your customers or your clients rather want you to harvest a certain size of a slender star or of a velocity. When you are planting it in a nursery, I've done it before um, with working lights as well as cocoa peat. It was successful for me. I wouldn't tell another person to do it the way that I did it because I had a lot of research and the people that I, I buy from my seedlings, which are plant forum, so they gave me the whole medium to do my own seedlings, mainly because they didn't have the much kgs that I wanted. At that time, I wanted 2,500. They didn't have that much. And so they sold me the medium. And that's how I did my seedlings, which was 100%. But I wouldn't advise somebody to do it the next morning and go to plant forum and say, hey, I'll, no, please don't. Like Andile said, buy the seedlings from wherever you buy your, your seedlings from. It is important as well for them to be uniformed. I want to emphasize so much on the part that we, everything needs to be uniformed because the moment you take your seedlings to the soil and everything else is fine, but now the other side is no longer the same anymore. It's a different situation. So you don't even know what is causing what. There's a, probably a disease. There's probably insects or anything that will disrupt your field and which can cause a loss. And nobody would really want to be in a loss situation. And so for transplanting, transplanting, you normally, for my advice, would say it's better to use drip irrigation than sprinklers. For many other reasons, sprinklers are not really good using it for your field because now they're just going to damage your raised beds or, or your ridges. With drip irrigation, it's much more easier because now you know that they're getting sufficient water 
and is not getting waterlogged and you know that it has enough preparations after and before using rather drip irrigation and not just sprinklers. So with that being said, I think for transplanting on land is much more labor intensive. On hydroponics, it's something else different. Thanks, Deborah. You really have lots of insight. And Dile, just your take in terms of your method growing hydroponically. Deborah said it's very labor intensive for her. How does it work in your case? I think with hydroponic, because we're using less space for more, it seems as if it's less labor intensive. But I promise you, she knows she's been there. She, we planted together once. Because we are on a lesser space, I'd say it's less labor intensive, but it will take you some time to finish. Whereas if you had more labor, you could do it faster. But again, I think in terms of hydroponic, there's like less work. I don't have to do any soil preparation because I don't have soil. The only thing that I need to be sure of is that my water pH is on the correct level because that spring onion is very sensitive too. If your pH goes less than six, then you are in trouble, which also goes back to the point that Daryl made to say you need to test your water before you do your irrigation. But my system or hydroponic farming is less intensive compared to being the normal farmer on an open field because obviously you can't plant half a hectare alone but with the system that I have and the size of the farm that I have I can do it alone even though it will take me the whole day but I can do it alone and funny how you might find out that we're planting more or less the same quantities because it's a lesser space and it's faster I can do it alone, whereas you might need a couple of people to help up in terms of with open field, obviously, with your space, you need people to help out in terms of measuring from 10 millimeters to 20 millimeters or 10 millimeters to 15 millimeters. You need to be sure to make sure that your field is accurate. But then for me with hydroponic, my system already is designed for a certain spacing. What I do when I transplant, I just take out my seedlings from the seedling tray and then just put it on a pot and drop it down on my system. That's the only work that I need to do compared to Devrol, whereas they need to measure the field. They need to make sure that it's the correct measurement for the entire field. But for me already, the sizes are there. What I need to do is just to take out my seedlings. Thanks so much, Andile. Now, I think earlier Deborah spoke about what's the best climate for this crop, but how does it work for you, Andile, in terms of being on a rooftop of a shopping center? Do you also kind of have to monitor that? And then maybe Deborah could also just speak about shading if it does get too hot. I think she spoke about 27 degrees being the most. And if it gets warmer, what are some of the advice that you have for when it comes to growing the specific crop? We'll still be talking about pests and diseases and also harvesting and then more about what the market looks like. For me, hydroponically, I'll speak in general to say it depends on the system that one has and how your structure is prepared. Does it have just a net only or is it net and plastic or just plastic only? And remember, the plastic tends to get hot. So other people tend to use fence or they use a wet wall. Others, they prefer to have it on the sides. They just have pull-up rolls whereby you just roll out your plastic whenever it's hot. And whenever it's cold, you can roll it down just to make sure that you tend to regulate the temperatures. But in most cases, I think for me, it's better that I'm growing them hydroponically. Somehow I'm able to manipulate the plant because it's always on water, even if it gets too hot, my water doesn't really drop to that extent or go up that extreme rather than with someone who's on open field. And with the structure, my plants are mostly shaded. I tend to somehow be able to manipulate the plant and create some favorable environment. Thanks, Andele. Just a a, a tip from your side, Devril, for someone that's planting in open fields. Because I started with spring onions, so I have mastered on my area of growing spring onions, especially when it comes to climate. I don't 
have shade nets or anything like that, but the shade nets for the other herbs like a coriander. But because of spring onion, I would say that onions or rather spring onions are not gedacht and generally speaking so. Um, they require a very cool condition during the early months with an optimum between 12 to 24 degrees for a good vegetative growth. And so the plants can tolerate much heat during the later stages of development. And so when higher temperatures are more favorable, higher temperatures averaging from 25 to 27, so that accelerates the bulbing process and is preferred from the start of the bulbing onward. Immediately when you get your seedlings, from your supplier it's important that you look at your temperatures as well further forecasts are not usually correct but you you can opt to say okay maybe i should get them the next week or a week before because the moment it starts with high temperatures from 25 to 27 the bulbing process now is starting to accelerate so you wouldn't want it to accelerate because now the bulb will be bigger but your leaf will be smaller and that is not how you'd want it, especially for your slender stars or your velocity or your Apache. But speaking from slender star and velocity. So when you get your low temperatures of 8 degrees to 13, that is near bulbing time retard development of the bulbs. And that can trigger bolting, which is your premature seedlings. You wouldn't want your premature seedlings to cause an illness or a disease rather. Because once it does that, then you have already made a loss. Once you do a transplanting, which I advise that you get your seedlings from a very high qualified person that knows how to do seedlings, I would rather say that it's important to look at your temperatures as well. It does affect here and there, but if you put in the right fertilizer for and during, it can somewhat take, adv- you take advantage really of the temperatures. So we know that one point to say that bring onions, they tolerate frost, but how it gets quite cold um, here in my area, we sometimes have snow, but it's always advisable to be creative if you don't have a frost cover. Frost cover, you should cover it up if you don't have, because now if you see the weather saying the cold front is coming, and more especially by not Kadak, we were probably having to have frost. So you, we get our people to come and assist to help us to cover it with the frost cover so that it does not go stagnant on the soil. Once you water your seedlings or your spring onions, when it's very cold, it's advisable to only once a day and not early in the mornings, usually in the afternoons, probably 30 minutes or 45 minutes. It shouldn't be a lot of water because we don't want it to water clog again because then you're causing another disease which is, it can be anything which can cause, obviously, the land to have its own diseases. And you wouldn't want that because now your clients are waiting for you to harvest. And so once it's stuck, you're waiting for two or three days. You can't outsmart it like how Andrea would. With the open fold, it's a different story altogether. You should, especially um, during cold days, you should actually be there to see if everything is going accordingly well to, to your plans and your temperature as well. And so in the summers, once it gets very hot, you know, it starts to create its own seedlings or it bolts quite easily. You wouldn't want this. This is where the sprinklers actually come in and help rather than the drip irrigation. So once it sprinkles, it cools the spring onion because, you know, the root can get really hot. And once it gets really hot, it affects what's on the top, which would be your 200 millimeters up. And your root is quite shallow. So once the moment it gets a cooling system, which is the sprinklers, then it can start to cool off and it wouldn't start bolting. So I could say that weather forecast and be there on the field to see what is going on because today will not be the same as tomorrow and tomorrow will not be the same as next week. Thanks, Deborah. Thanks for that. And I think we've covered a lot when it comes to watering the specific crop. Maybe we can just talk briefly about pests and diseases, some of the challenges that you guys have faced when it comes to this crop. Andile, maybe I can start with you. I'll always say this. The nice thing about being a hydroponic farmer is that you experience less of what a regular farmer experiences. Since I've started planting spring onion, I haven't had any diseases. And I wouldn't say much about diseases because I don't have that much experience or it hasn't occurred to my field whereby I had an incident where my spring onion dies or anything like that. I always get my hand in terms of harvesting. The only incident that I had, it was only one. There's a number of pests that one can experience when they're planting out spring onion. On my side, I had aphid whereby 
for instance, when you're planting out spring onion, it's always advisable to say, I don't know how others they get their seedlings, but in most cases, they count them, they plant between eight to 10 seeds per pot to make sure that they plant eight to 10 seeds per pot when doing the seedling. So when you get your seedlings there, it's either one pot has eight or it has 10. And they do 10 because of the germination rate. In case few don't survive, there should be some that survives at least eight. So when you're planting your eight, when you plug them out already, that's like your bunch for your spring onion. So the incident with aphids, it only occurred on one bunch in order for me to prevent that because with hydroponic, it's easily spread because my plants are next to each other. So if they start in one, and then obviously there's a next one whereby two or three can fly and then seek to the next plant whereby the next thing, all of them can just jump to the next one, to the next one, to the next one. Luckily, I still use the method whereby they say the best fertilizer is the farmer's footprint. I check my plants on a daily basis. So I think I caught that early and I took out that plant where it was and threw it away. And that was the only incident whereby I had pests on my field. But others tend to experience whereby they have snails or they have slugs. And reason being, it's because we're using water as well and it turns out that I find spring onion being a cool plant. So that's the reason why I think some of those things tends to stay on that plant. But in terms of diseases, I haven't had any diseases whereby others tend to experience white rot or a black mold or killing or dumping off from your crops. But for me, I haven't experienced any of those. And I think those are some of the advantages that if you're a hydroponic farmer, you tend to have. Thanks, Andile. Devil, before I get to you, I see Duncan Masiwa, who's the head of news at Food from Zanzi, would like to ask a question. Duncan, the floor is yours. Hey, Dawn. Hey, Andile. Hey, Devil. Thank you so much for opening up the space. Andile, you're part of the furniture now already with Food from Zanzi. <laughs> <laughs> Met you, Devil, uh, last year at a FASA's conference. So it's nice hearing your voice again. I just have a question quickly, um, Andile, for you, and then um, one for you as well, um, Devil. How is um, South Africa's interest in terms of cultivating spring onion looking like you know is, is there a, is there an increased demand in terms of farmers looking towards planting spring onions and delay what are the varieties that are currently in, in high demand i'll take you back to say do your market research know when you're growing spring onion who you're going to sell it to most people now are more conscious about what they eat and the type of vegetables that they want to eat not so long, there was a high demand of spring onion. People were calling left, right, and center to ask who has spring onion. And apparently I had a lot of people who referred others to me to say, she has spring onion, whereby I thought, okay, probably I might be called the spring onion lady now, no longer spinach lady. There's a high demand for spring onion because of what people tend to eat as well. And we've mentioned a number of varieties that people tend to enjoy one being slender, which I think most of us farmers are growing at the moment. Thanks, Andile. I see Intekelelo, I, th I think that you were trying to also become a speaker. If, if you're not able to do it, maybe you can just DM me and then I'll ask you a question. I think you might be having trouble with your network. Just some of the challenges in terms of pests and diseases. You mentioned, you know, frost being one of them. Just to briefly just talk about that before we talk about markets. I've never um, had a disease really but only on the parts where um, it was overgrowing. And I could see that in my field, there was downy mildew and purple blotch. So both which are favored by moist conditions. So this is where I always come back and say that when you are an open field farmer, it's important that you don't overwater your spring onions. You don't plant them on a wet soil or a waterlogged soil or field or wherever there's just a lot of water because you are going to get your leaf diseases and which is your downy mildew and your purple blotch. With the pests, the only issues that I have with uh, my pests is actually only the thrips. The thrips are the ones that are causing commotion, but it's not really a havoc really. You can, you know, your spraying program should be on point. It's also a disadvantage because now you cannot control the climate. Sometimes you can find efforts as well, which is controllable, yes, 
So you find best ways to tackle that, which, which I normally use um, Sapermetrin and Rose K. I mix them together because they do two things for me, which is to make my leaf to be really good because the, the threads would have affected it. So the Rose K does some, it does some good justice to them. And with Sapermetrin, it gets rid of the thrips and the, the aphids. So basically, that's what I use. For the diseases, I usually control them with Hagra Boost. Especially after frost or snow, I use Hagrid Boost the next morning to control the diseases of my Madonna Maldu and Purple Blotch. I use Spore Kill and Counter In as well as Kung Fung. And also, I think I should also mention the part of the weeds, especially in the winter time. It's a slow growing small plant which is easily overgrown by weeds. So your good weed control practices are thus imperative for seed beds or direct seeded lands. Select fields which are relatively weed free. Before you can even plant, you can use paraquats or glyphosate to kill the emerged weeds on the lands, easily ready and prepared for planting. The herbicide um, is most effective weed control measure. Weed competition with the newly emerged or transplanted spring onion seedlings for the first two months of growth can have a very deleterious effect on the crop of the yields. Thanks so much, Deborah. And Sikilelo is really trying to ask a question. You have the floor. Thank you so much. What would you like to ask our speakers? I've started growing uh, spring onion and onions this year because my market doesn't want pesticides on uh, spinach and cabbages. Especially boxers is very picky because they have got a demand of 25,000 spinach a month. So because uh, I do my own seedlings, or well, spring onion, I use unconventional method, kind of spring them up quickly, uh, which is uh, female contraceptives, and they're kind of working very well. I'm able to sprout within three or four days, and I'm planting individually, and so far, so good. Diseases like mildew, I use milk, the water. Spinach, I had to change my seed to hybrid because the normal one gets a lot of diseases. So I'm also an open field farmer, planting on about seven hectares. I don't have the market for spring onions, but I'm only just doing it because of slugs and kind of deters them away like a lot. Because like this year, I haven't seen a lot of slugs compared to last year. Thanks so much for your contributions. And I'm so happy to have you on the space and also contributing as a grower of spring onions. Just a question. Did I hear you correctly? Did you say that you use female contraceptives? I literally quickly Googled it. How does that work? Has anyone else done this? We just could elaborate a little bit more on that. You know, the 28 days one? I take that one pill and I crush it and I dilute it into a five liter watering can. I water my seedlings with it, like every single can day. Can I ask, what made you to use the female contraceptives? Banana farmers have been saying the same thing. The thing is, there was a farmer that was there and I was asking, how does he get it a lot quicker? You know, like for me, the reason why I started doing my own seedlings is because when you buy seedlings from other people, you, you don't know which variety you're getting. They just give you spinach. And then like, because I didn't have the choice and also to bring down the cost price, because like now, it cost me like like two hundred fifty to produce a bunch of spinach, or two hundred fifty to produce a cabbage right now because of starting seedlings for myself and doing it for myself. Because I do about an average about forty thousand seedlings every three months. A banana farmer just told me that and I was like, no man, I used to do this. I used to put contraceptives, and then I was like, oh what? And then I was like, okay, let me go research. Then I found that yes, it has a lot of vitamins inside, and it, and even they use it to ladies that can't conceive or they're not fertile, so they, they give them contraceptives. So that's how I ended up finding out about all of those things. I totally love it. I need to do more research. And I think I'm actually thinking about a really cool space we could have. All of these interesting methods that we have maybe haven't heard about. <laughs> that would be a really cool space. Uh, I'm going to invite you back for that. Uh, and Dile, have you heard of it? Just last year, I'm also looking at the time which I think would have now, I would add it as part of my advice. One is, it was that he says he doesn't have market for spring onion and people are more conscious of what they're eating. If you go to someone and say, I use contraceptives to produce my spring onion, I'm more conscious of what I'm eating and how it's produced. That adds to your market. And also the other thing, the market somehow, depending on who's your target market, they're looking for global GAP certified or local GAP certified. I don't know if the contraceptives, because they do test your produce before it can get certified. So you just need to be sure if you using the contraceptive, it doesn't come back in terms of hammering the results that you're getting. And also you need to know 
everything that's added on the contraceptive as an let's take it as a fertilizer you would need to know that your LAN what composes the LAN they in most cases so just be sure and when you're telling people how you produce your spring onion be conscious about it if those are your sort of target clients because somehow mm-hmm. that raises a lot of questions I only use it to pop them for like once one on like on the trays. Okay, maybe we should actually see how we can expand on this topic and maybe think about, you know, what of the creative ways but also what are some of the things that we should be thinking about. And thanks for that, Andile. Before we wrap up, maybe we can just talk more about the markets for this crop and also just briefly harvesting and storage and then packaging. Andile, maybe you can start in terms of your harvesting process for someone who's growing it hydroponically. And then I'm also going to get my other two speakers to just talk about, you know, how they do it in an open field as well. About growing most of the things, the leafy greens hydroponically, it's that the moment they get to receive water or the moment they get to a cooler condition, they tend to be alive. And with spring onion, whenever we harvest it, we just pull it out from the pot. And as I've mentioned that we getting a, our seedlings as in, it comes in a form of a bunch whereby it's either eight or it's either 10. Between that numbers, it forms our bunch as a whole. So we just pull it out from our growing pots, rinse it with water, nothing else added on it. And I also like to add that we growing all our vegetables, including the spring onion, organically. During harvesting, we just pull it from the pot and just rinse it off with water because we're using cocoa peat just to add a support for our seedlings in terms of if our pump goes off, there should be some moisture during that moment. But then it's just to rinse off the cocoa peat. And also we're using, Deborah will remind me, those small bags which we normally use for packaging spring onion. Depending also on what your client requires, some they just need them to be on a box. And also they'll tell you if they want them into grams or kg or just a bunch. It also differs on who you supply. I have different clients whereby they'll tell you, bring me a box. And I should know how many to add in a box. And some will tell me I need a kg. I normally use a scale for that. But you should have an idea to say, in a kg, how many bunches do you actually have? Because that also determines the number of seedlings that I've used to form a kg or my grams. So for me, it's easy. It's just plugging it out from the pot, rinse it into the plastic, a rubber band just to tie the roots and the plastic together. And off it goes to the market. Because most of my clients are within the farm. It's mostly from farm to table, but for someone who has a cold room, they can also store it on a cold room, harvest today, and then you store it on a cold room, and then you deliver it the next day. But I haven't had any incident whereby I harvest today, and it stays overnight, and then the next morning I deliver it. Turns out that it's in a certain condition. It's mostly always at the best condition and whenever I rinse it off with water it just comes back to life. Thanks Andile. Just in terms of your experience Deborah in terms of your harvesting process and then storaging and packaging and then additional types of farmers? With harvesting it's usually the same just like Andile has just said you just take it out of the soil but with my experience because you know with my clients usually they would want um, 500 to 2.5 tonnages so it's quite labor intensive hence we go back to the soil preparations your soil should be really soft and onions they really have i mean shallow roots so it's actually quite easy to take it out of the soil and so once you take it out of the soil now we have to work um systematically i call it uh, the devil situation ship way because it's so much labor, labor intensive but now we have to work in a systematic way where there's ones that have to check it out the other four must come and take them out and put them somewhere so that we can be able to rinse it out with water. Strictly water, nothing else. So we um, we have to rinse it twice with because my field, it's red soil, very loamy and clay. So we rinse it twice. So there's specific people that need to rinse it out. So there's one group that rinse out the first time and there's another group that rinse out the second time. 
And so when you package it, it's the same way um, according to your clients. There's one client who doesn't want the roots and the one client would tell me that he wants it in boxes and just tie them up. The other one would say, listen, just put them according to bundles and each bundle should be one kilogram and one kilogram probably wants a 1.5 kilograms. We have to let them sleep over in a very cool, dry place so that they can the next very morning see to it to the client or sometimes the client comes in and takes his 1.5. We have a market in the market. So once we take it to the Twana market or we take it to in Whitbank market, it's intense because I have like four clients, each one's 500. And sometimes I don't even have that 500. That's how I'm like, Andy, do you have something? And she'll be like, I have nothing. <laughs> and I'm like, that means we're in trouble because we have nothing. So it does become a problem going forward with it. It's just a matter of having to train your workers to work um, efficiently and on time so that we do make it in time for the big clients and the small clients. For storaging, we place them actually in a place where we can be able to let them be alive until the next day and take it to the client or the client comes and takes it or we take it to the Whitbank or Tawana markets. I must say the two of you are like the funniest speakers that I've had on the station. Thank you so much for joining me and thank you so much to everyone else who contributed and say hello thank you so much for your comments as well is there anything else that you'd like to share as we wrap up about the specific crop and then maybe just more about the other things that you're producing i know you mentioned you know do you do other hubs just you know as a way of networking maybe someone's hearing you know, something that they want to chat to you about afterwards um, as we wrap up and you know, i'm going to start with you oh i find it funny that i'm always the first and in most yeah. cases they'll tell me that my name starts with an a so we go <laughs> as like <laughs> so either way i'll say people who want to grow spring onion they should just check out all the key important notice to say one do your market research know where you're getting your seedlings if you're buying seedlings know the type of cultivar that you're going to produce so that you use the correct method for it and be sure that when you're harvesting your people know what they're doing you deliver what your clients requires because that's where your money is. If you're producing something that nobody wants to buy, you're going to end up getting four rand, two rand, or three rand for that. Whereas your spring onion are worth 10 times what they're giving you. If you do your market research prior, get to know the type of seedlings that you want to get. When you're receiving your seedlings, be sure that they're healthy, they're of the right size. And also, again, I always say it simply starts with one seed. The other crops that I grow, if you're looking for leafy green, any sorts of leafy green, you can DM me and I'll hook you up. Thanks, Andile. Devrol, just your final comments as we wrap up and then also just other crops that you grow. For land situation, I think um, it's important that I emphasize on the fertilizing program as well. Your fertilizing program should be according to what's based on the soil analysis results. So you don't want to overdo your lawn 28 or your lawn 30 as your top dressing or after four weeks if you see nothing is working out. However, take care not to overapply nitrogen because any excess leads to tender seedlings that transplant poorly and are more susceptible to diseases. Excess nitrogen results in delayed maturity, softer bulbs and bulb rots and deficiency results in smaller bulbs. The production field will probably require a similar dressing of fertilizer mixture followed by one or two dressings of lan, generally between 500 kilograms and 1,000 kilograms of 2, 3, 4, 30 fertilizer mixture per hectare, um, depending on soil fertility status, is required. I think it's very important that you don't want to damage your soil or your spring onion I didn't touch anything on fertilizing program because of its shallow roots. Once again, you should be really spot on as well. Your nitrogen shouldn't be too much. It does cause a little bit of havoc and water clogging is not wanted in your fields. Yeah, I do two hectares of spinach, coriander and beetroot. That is what I have, but I, I cannot be promising a lot on the spinach because anyone that wants spinach, you can call me coriander, you can call me, as well as rockets. And of course, the lovely spring onion. Thank you. 
Thanks, Dave Roll. Thanks so much. And usually, you know, guys, Tapile, who is an agricultural economist at the NMC, as I'm wrapping up, he always clicks the mic. Tabile, I'm going to give you the floor, but you only have like a minute. Tabile, the floor is yours. For me, I'm just going to make a, a simple comment around the spring onion in general, or even onions as a commodity in South Africa. Uh, in recent years, I think there's, there has been a significant trend. The market, there is a lot of folks getting in to produce it. And the reason to that is because there's so much demand of it. Uh, not necessarily in South Africa, even our neighboring countries, South Africa has increased its production its exports, particularly the neighboring countries, are drastically because there is so much demand of it, including Europe, uh, some of the bigger markets in Europe doing a lot of buying from South Africa. So for farmers, the guys that are now within the, this production, this commodity, think they should even pull through uh, in terms of other colleagues that they think they can work with. There's so much demand for the commodity. Actually, South Africa has increased so much of its export, particularly last year, even, even in terms of your imports, there's a bit of are consistent in terms of our imports because we are consuming a lot, not only because we are exporting, but also because there's a domestic increase in terms of demand for it. So I think that's for general farmers, this is one commodity that they should look into because it's also a commodity that can be grown almost throughout the year. So there are big profit margins for it. So that's just what I, was, just what I wanted just to say for the colleagues and also just for the farmers that would like to get into farming in general. This is one commodity that one should consider given that it is a required vastly, not in South Africa but regionally and also globally. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tabile. And always on point, I must invite you to all of my spaces just to give that perspective as an agricultural economist. Thank you. Thank you so much. And listen, guys, that is a wrap for tonight. Let's gather to grow. If you missed any part of it, you know that it will be available on Food from Zanzi's YouTube channel. And then, of course, Duncan and his team writes up an awesome story based on all the points that were discussed as well. And that will also be published on Food from Zanzi. That's www.foodfromzanzi.co.za. Tabile, Andile, Nsilegelo, Devrol, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks, Duncan, for your contributions as well. And thank you so much to everyone else for being here. It's really awesome. I'll see you guys next week. Same time, same place, same space. Bye for now. Have a good evening.